Good morning, saints of God, and welcome once again to our virtual Sunday school class. I am so excited to be back with you guys today. I love you guys. I miss you so much. But I am so excited today. I have a spirit of expectation. I can't explain it. Don't know why. But I just know God is getting ready to do something awesome in our lives. And I just thank him and praise him. And I just want you all to join in with me as we give God a hand clap of praise for what he is about to do. A yet praise. We haven't seen it yet. But we know that it's coming, and I thank and praise God. Let us open with prayer. I have any fathers, once more again, we come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts. God, we thank you, we praise you, we bless you, we magnify you, and we lift you up. For this is the day that the Lord hath made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Oh God, we just bless you just for being God, just for being our Father God. And we're your children, and your word declares that you love us, and we can cast our curse on you, God. God, we just thank you for your provision. Thank you for your loving us and caring for us and protecting us. God, even in this pandemic, you're still God and you're still showing us, God, that you have all power in your hands. Now, God, we just thank you for this place called Bethel, uh, the house of prayer. Thank you for the leadership here, our pastor and first lady. Thank you for all that you have done, are doing, and are yet going to do. God, we ask now that you would bless those, God, who have been stricken by this COVID-19. God, we ask you, God, to heal as only you can heal. Touch God and deliver as only you can do. God, the bereaved families, those who have lost loved ones, God, just let them know that earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal. Oh, God, we just thank you for your faithfulness, even when we aren't. God, when we look back over our lives and see how far you brought us, we can't help but say thank you, God. And when we recall this to mind, we still have hope. It is because of your mercies that will not consume. Your compassions, they fail not. Your mercies are new every morning, so great is your faithfulness. Now, God, as we dare into this lesson. God's still talking about wisdom. Let my words be your words and my thoughts your thoughts. God, hide me behind the cross so the people will see none of me but all of you. Oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. And God, we realize we sin and come short of your glory, but your word declares if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we say thank you, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. We have Bible study guide number nine for August 2nd, 2020. And the subject of our lesson is faith and wisdom. Our Bible background comes from James first chapter, verses 1 through 11. Our printed text, James 1, verses 1 through 11. And devotional reading, Isaiah 40, chapter, verses 1 through 8. And as always, we encourage you to read that at your own leisure. Our aim for change, by the end of the lesson, we will consider the relationship between wisdom and perseverance through trials. Affirm the value of trials and hardships and making us more wise and productive disciples. And pray for godly wisdom by which to endure life's trials and temptations. Our scripture to keep in mind, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. James 1 and 5. Our in focus, Cornelius' ancestors were careful keepers of their family history. His great grandmother inscribed their family tree onto the pages of a large Bible, and his grandfather continued to add to it. Cornelius was amazed to see his name written on a family tree that stretched back to the 1840s. The African diaspora consists of millions of people like Cornelius whose ancestors were stolen from the motherland for the mid-Atlantic slave trade. Their faith gave them strength and their experiences gave them wisdom to pass on to successive generations. The first name on Cornelius' family tree was a na man named John who was born a slave in the 1840s. John became a Christian after he was freed from slavery. The church operated the school that taught John to read and write. Eventually, John became a preacher and the church paid for his college education. John organized schools so that other people could attain college educations. Cornelius is a member of his ancestor John's church and attended a historically black college that his ancestor helped support. Cornelius learned that faith and wisdom can help believers overcome life's trials. What wisdom was passed down to you through the experiences of your ancestors? What wisdom have you learned through your own experiences? What role did faith in God have in your ancestors' experiences and your own experience? 
And I don't know about you all, about you all, but, um, and I, you probably have the same experience that we have, but my mother was raised by her grandmother and grandfather, and they would just tell her how they were raised, tell her how things were back during their era, and she in turn told us and told our grandchildren, and she would sit down with my grandchildren and tell them some of the things that they had to endure, tell them some of the things they had to do without, and they were in, in just shock and amazement and how rough life was for them. But we need to let our children know how far we've come so that they won't take for granted the things that they have today. They just think life is easy and everything's supposed to come to them on a silver platter. But they need to know that people paid their blood and their lives for us to get where we are today. So today we're gonna talk about faith and wisdom. So the introduction says, in case you haven't heard, this is the information age. Everything, or so it seems, can be assessed online, from medical records to legal opinions, from academic scholarship to celebrity gossip. All is available with a simple search on your computer or phone. And I told you in a previous lesson that I had, a lot of my materials I get offline because the information is right there and it's readily available. Countless libraries work for information is now publicly accessible through the internet. But while we are glutted with information, it is right to ask exactly what we are doing with all of it. In spite of all the generalized and specialized information at our fingertips, are we any wiser as a society? After all of the information that is readily available to us, are we any wiser as a society? Are we taking this, this information in? Are we using it wisely? This month's study, there will be five lessons drawn from the letter of James. Help us evaluate that question. So the purpose of the book of James is to expose unethical practices and to teach right Christian behavior. The author of the book is James, who was Jesus' half-brother. And as you know, while Jesus was alive, he did not believe that he was the Messiah. He was not a follower of his, but it was not until after the resurrection that James became a believer and God used him to write this book. The book is written to first century Jewish Christians residing in Gentile communities outside Palestine and to all Christians everywhere. After Stephen was martyred, then there was a great persecution among Christians. So they had to scatter and go abroad. And that's why we call this the Disaphora because they had to leave their homelands and go other places so they wouldn't be persecuted. Because these early believers did not have the support of established Christian churches, James wrote to them as a concerned leader to encourage them in their faith during this difficult time. So they had to leave their, their churches, they had to leave their homeland, and they had to go to other places, and they needed encouragement. So uh, James decided to write to them to encourage them. So when we begin to look at our scripture, James 1 and 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have our perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I think that bears repeating. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich in that he is made low. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. Verse 11 says, For the sun is no soon risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. So, in the first verse, James says, in the second verse, James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. He calls them my brethren because these are people that he loved. These are people that he's concerned about. These are people who he wants to prosper and who want to be successful as Christians. He's writing to the ethnic Jews who have accepted Jesus as the Messiah. 
They are scattered about in all different communities, as I said. This letter expresses James' concern for persecuted Christians who were once part of the Jerusalem church. And, and, and saints of God, we need to remember that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. I love my brothers and sisters here at Bethel. As a matter of fact, I am closer to some of my brothers and sisters here than I am some members of my own family. We are a family. We are united by the blood of Jesus. And then it says the imperative verb count implies a thoughtfulness that not only looks at a situation, but it looks through it to its potential result. It says when we fall is the condition for James' exhortation to count it all joy. The word temptation as used here refers to trials or testing. It's not one that refers to a sin because God does not uh, mean an enticement to do evil. While God tests us, he never provokes us. He never tempts us to sin. James doesn't say if we face trials, but when we face them. Because if you are a Christian, you're going to face some trials. You're going to have some tribulations. The enemy is going to see to that, especially if you are a threat to his kingdom. So the phrase fall into implies a sudden, unexpected encounter. You know how it is. You're going along, life is, is good, the sun is shining, you're getting along well, then all of a sudden you, you, you get sick in your body. Your finances get messed up. Your relationships get messed up. You get betrayed. Your marriage is all out of whack. Your children are acting crazy. All of a sudden, this happens. Those are trials and those are tribulations. In modern English, we would put an E on the end of the word divers to spell it diverse because it simply means different kinds or various temptations. The temptations Christians face are not all one kind. Satan likes to change it up and mix it up. Just after you get out of one trial, one uh, circumstance, seems like something else comes because he's always trying to throw something in there to get you off God, something to get you discouraged, something to make you want to give up. We're not required to pretend to be happy when we face pain, but to have a positive outlook because of the results trials will bring. The word of God says, in everything give thanks, not for everything, but in everything give thanks. Because we have to remember, whatever we're going through, God is behind the scenes, and he's working things out for us. He's controlling everything that's happening to us. The advice Jane gives might initially seem counter to what is reasonable for most of us. Because when we start going through, the first thing we want to do is say, oh, Lord, why me? Oh, why am I going? What did I do? Oh, Lord. But James said, no, we need to count it all joy, knowing that this is going to work to our good. James knows this, so he addresses this in the next verse. James tells us, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The word knowing introduces another instruction for using the mind. Know in your mind that the trying of your faith will result in it being genuine. You got to know this in your mind. When you're going through trials, when you're going through tribulations, you can't respond to your sufferings. You can't respond to your tribulations with emotions. You can't respond by how your body feels. Because one day you feel like a nut and one day you don't. One day you're on the mountain, the next day you're in the valley. One day you believe God and one day you're wondering, God, where are you? So we can't believe with our emotions. We can't believe with our bodies. But we've got to believe and know what we know in our mind. In our mind. James tells us to turn our hardships into times of learning. Rough times can teach us patience, perseverance, and steadfastness. We need to find out what can I learn through this trial. Okay, God, what are you trying to teach me through this? James wants his readers to realize that there is a bigger picture than the troubles that, face, that you are facing in that moment. God has a bigger plan in mind. The bigger goal is, uh, the bigger picture is a goal toward which all suffering should point. The increase of your patience. And you know, a lot of times we don't have a lot of patience. And sometimes I, I have to catch myself because my patience gets short. And I tell people all the time, the older you get, the less uh, patience you have for nonsense. You don't have tolerance for it. So sometimes I have to slow my road and say, okay, Geraldine, where's your patience? Where's your patience? James encourages us 
uh, not to have just mere passive endurance or just think hunkering down until the storm passes. You know how it is like, oh, Lord, I guess I'll just sit here and wait till my change come. Lord, how long? No, the patient James advocate is active and confident. This includes continuing to do what's right, continuing to love people, continuing to be kind to people. You know, there are some people when they're going through, they hate the whole world. They're upset with everybody and everything. They're ready to bite your head off at the, the slightest little thing that you said. But that's not how James is telling us to act. The full working of patience leads to three things. One is perfection, wholeness, and not lacking anything. This is not a uh, sinless perfection. It means a maturity and the ability to take on honorable tasks for God because the person has proven to be of solid character. When you can press a beer through trials and tribulation, God says, okay, they're ready. I can trust them now. God works through us so he can work in us. There are some things he's got to get in us and some things he's got to get out of us before he can work through us. It conveys the idea of a thing completed in all its parts. It refers to Christians who have overcome those things that may disqualify him or her from ministry. You know, everybody's not fit for ministry yet. Everybody's not re uh, ready for ministry yet. There are some things that as I foresaid, God has to work in us and to mature in us so that we'll be able to stand. Because when you go into ministry, you're going to face a lot of different things. You're going to face a lot of different attitudes. You're going to face a lot of different people. And you've got to know how to be able to handle that. The phrase wanting nothing means not one thing left behind or lacking is another description of maturity. So verse 4 says, so let patience have a perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You've got to let patience do its work. You've got to let patience do what it needs to do so that you will have everything that you need to be successful in what it is that God is calling you to do. Here is the desired result of exercising patience. The fact that James wants his readers to be perfect and entire is troubling to some since there was only one perfect pe person. And we say, you know, Jesus was the only one perfect. We can't be perfect. But James doesn't speak of per perfectness as sinlessness. The one who is perfect is the one who consistently tries to do what's right. The one who consistently tries to overcome sinful behaviors and attitudes. And although we know that it's not possible, possible for us to be perfect in this early life, this earthly life, this early Christian life, that doesn't mean the standard should be lowered. The Father's perfection is our continuing standard. Even though we may not reach perfection, that don't mean that we can't stop trying. We can't really know the depth of our character until we see how we react to something. You know, we always say, well, if this would happen to me, I wouldn't do this, or I wouldn't do that, or I would do that. You don't know what you will do until you're in that situation. There's an old saying that said, what's in you? When you squeeze, it's going to come out. You squeeze an orange, orange juice is coming out. You squeeze a lemon, lemon juice is coming out. You squeeze a person, and what's in them is going to come out. If you're a Christian, you're going to come out, quote scriptures, most of the time. And sometimes, you know, we miss it now. <laughs> But if you don't have any word in you, you're going to come out cussing and fussing and screaming and hollering. So we've got to let patience have its perfect work. The word, and then verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally, and upbraid if not, and it shall be given to him. The focus of James' exhortation now shifts from trials to wisdom. Wisdom is needed in order to come through the trials of life in a way that leads to spiritual maturity. Remember we had lessons on wisdom a couple of months ago and we were talking about wisdom. It's not merely knowledge, but it's knowing how to apply the knowledge. What good is knowledge if you don't know how to apply it? Wisdom gives a believer a sense of direction that will help him or her know how to respond to trials in a way that will lead to maturity. Wisdom comes from God. And when we talk about wisdom, there were three things we talked about. One was discretion. And that was the quality of behavior or speaking in a way to avoid causing offense. You speak in a way where you don't offend people. Then there was discernment. And that's the ability to judge well. 
You have to d discern certain situations and then have the ability to learn how to handle that situation. And then there is prudence. And this is the quality of being cautious, showing good and careful judgment when handling practical matters. You just can't rush into it. You have to be prudent and do what is best. And then verse 6 says, But let him ask in faith nothing and wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now it says that when you ask of God, he'll give it to you liberally and he will not upbraid you. It means God won't get mad at you. God won't fuss at you but not knowing. God won't say, you mean you've been a Christian all these years and you don't know that? I remember Reverend Reed when we were in, in Sunday school and Bible study and he said the only uh, dumb question is the one you don't ask. And some people don't ask questions because they think, well, people may look at me and think, I, I should know this, I should know that. But, but Jesus is not like that. He said, ask of God, and he'll give you what you need to know. But it says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. As important as it is to ask, it is critical to do so in faith, nothing wavering. James's readers may well find themselves struggling to trust God because of what they suffer. And before we start to shake our head and cluck our tongues, let's look at our lives. Let's look at our lives. When we're going through struggles, it's hard sometimes. It's hard sometimes. And you want to know, God, how long am I going to have to go through this? God, I know that you're a God, but God, I don't know if I can come out of this. God, this is a big one. God, I don't know if you can do this. But, but, but God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all we ask or think. To ask in faith means asking with confidence that God will align our desires with his purpose. The word of God says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that he's going to grant the petition that we ask of him. So... Uh, it says, James illustrates this danger of doubt by comparing a doubt to a wave of the sea as driven by the wind. I don't know how many of you have ever been to the, or, or to the beach and seen the ocean and the wind get started and, and, and the waves are just all over the place. Every which way, or you see a hurricane and how the, the, the waves are just overlapping and everything and, and it's just going this way and that way. That's, it's just all off course. It's not stable. And that's the way some of us are as Christians. And it reminded me about Elijah in 1 Kings 18, 21. He asked the people, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be Baal, then you follow him. If you say God is able, then when you get on a trial, when you get on a situation, don't change your mind. Believe that God is still able. Joshua told the people to choose you this day whom you will serve. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. dwell. He said, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That was Joshua 24, 15. And then in Revelation 3 and 14, the church of the Laodiceans, he said, God told them, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold or hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. God does not like wishy-washy people. He does not like you up today and down tomorrow. God wants you to trust that he is God and he will do what he says he will do. That he is able to keep that which he has committed unto you against that day. And then verse 7 says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. When you are double-minded, you're not going to receive anything of the Lord because you're not steadfast. You're not unmovable. You're not always abounding in the works of the Lord. It says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. This phrasing is another way of expressing the injunction to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Doubleness, on the other hand, suggests conflicted loyalties and indecisiveness. It is associated with sin because it implies a lack of of total devotion to God. Such a person is unstable because of unflicted loyalties. They, they want to think what the world says and what their friends say, and then they got to try to uh, put that up against what God says. No, you forget all that other stuff. It's about what the word of God says. 
It says such a person is unstable because of conflicted loyalties. He or she tries to serve both God and the world, simultaneously ends up doing neither very well. The word of God says you can't serve God and mammon. You will love the one and hate the other, hate one and love the other. You can't do it. You can't do it. And then verse 9 says, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. The focus of James' message shifts again. Economic concerns are a central part of James' message in this letter. So now you might be saying, well, what does that have to do with what we've just been talking about? Well, it says the brother of low degree is not merely humble or sad or down in the dumps. He is poor. The poor is to rejoice in that they are exalted. There is a goal or an end to the experience of poverty. It can be a transformative experience that draws them closer to God. When you are poor, you have to rely on God. You have to look to God to meet your needs. You have to believe and trust God. But when you've got money in the bank, when you've got resources, then you think, I don't need God. I can do this on my own. The poor should be glad. Riches mean nothing to God. Otherwise, they would be considered unworthy. I can remember years ago, we used to sing a song that if religion was a thing that money could buy, then the rich man would live and the poor would die. But I'm glad God fixed it. In his own way, that whosoever believe in him shall be saved. So God does not look at your riches. He does not look at what you have. It says, to James, the rich are those who mistreat the poor and oppress them. Verse 10 says, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. The rich should be glad wealth means nothing to God, too, because wealth is easily lost. We find true wealth by developing our spiritual life, not our financial assets. And I'm going to say that one more time. We find true wealth by developing our spiritual life, not our financial assets. God is interested in what is lasting, which is our souls, not in what is temporary, our money and our possessions. Christians who are exalted in this world should be glad because they are great in the Lord's eyes. So don't get upset when people don't speak well of you. Don't get upset when people aren't always bowing down to you. Don't get upset when people are always calling your name because you are great in the eyes of the Lord. Man will lift you up one day and pull you down the next. But when God exalts you, no man can pull you down. This brother of low degree is a person of humble circumstances without status or wealth. Such people are often overlooked, even in our churches today, but they are not overlooked by God. My, 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 my. You know how people, this person has money, this person has the education, this person has status. And so we want to naturally all, you know, lift this person up. And then the person sitting back there is probably the person who is praying and interceding for you and, and going to God on your behalf. So we need to be careful. James talks about a man coming in with fine clothes and we give him the finest seat and somebody with raggedy clothes and we act like, you know, they are no good. He speaks about that. But there is a note a redemption here. The rich man who decides to come to God can very well rejoice in being made low. That is, in taking on the humility of a follower of Christ. But as James' language suggests, it is much more likely that the arrogant, rich, with whom James' readers have to deal with will ultimately face the judgment of God for their action. James draws on a very familiar Old Testament language of judgment to speak on the faith of the rich. And as we close out, uh, verse 11 says, For the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. The stages in which a flower withers or passes away illustrates this. You see flowers, they're beautiful. We have calla lilies. And when that calla lily bloomed, oh, it was beautiful. And I would go out there every day and I would look at it. But as the sun began to get hot and as it got dry, that, it, that bloom just withered up. And that's the way it is with, with, with rich people. The rich person will fade away in its ways and that the entirety of a selfishly lavish lifestyle will come under the withering judgment of God. So if wealth, power, and status mean nothing to God, why do we attribute so much importance to them? Why do we work our fingers to the bone, trying to get every dime that we can, trying to get all the houses and the lands and all the possessions that we can? Do our material possessions give us goals and is our only reason for living? Is that why we live? To get all we can and can all we get? Or are we living to live again? 
If all of our possessions were gone, what would be left? What would we have if all our possessions were suddenly taken? I thank God that the joy, the peace, the love, and the salvation that God has given us, nobody can take that away from us. Not our bank accounts matter to God. What we have in our hearts do. Not our bank accounts, not any possessions that we have, but what God has given us, that is what matters, and that is what's precious to us. I thank God for this lesson. Thank you guys so much for joining in with us every Sunday. I'm believing God that soon we're going to be back together, but until we do, thank God for our awesome media ministry who allows us to come Sunday after Sunday and to minister to you. Always, I encourage you to wash your hands, to wear your mask, to wait six feet, you know, social distancing, and just know that God loves you, and so do I. Be blessed and have a great week.